Hello everyone, I'm Aydoğan Vatandaş, the editor-in-chief of Politurko.com. Today I am joined by uh, a well-known movie uh, maker, a producer, a director, author, a scholar from Norway. Uh, Jorgen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me to this interview. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Aydoğan. Jorgen, uh, so I know you uh, with your documentary, uh, gift from God. So first I want to ask you how the idea to make a documentary about a military coup attempt in Turkey uh, came to your mind. So were you following the news in Turkey? Were you interested in the Turkish politics? How did it come to your mind to make a documentary about a military coup attempt in Turkey? I think uh, we have to start a little bit from the beginning because uh, I'm married to a Turkish woman uh, and that means that Turkey is my second country. Uh, I've been to Turkey for, before the coup attempt, I've been to Turkey for 20 years. I've mm -hmm. uh, been living there partly with our kids uh, and have a very close relationship to the country, to the people, to the culture, to the wonderful food <laughs> in Turkey. I see. Uh, so I know the place very well and um, this summer we went as many summers before for holiday in, mm -hmm. uh, in Turkey. So were you in Turkey in that summer in 2016? We were there, yes. So you saw the coup? So we were there, we, were, uh, exp we didn't really see it because we were not either in Ankara yeah, city Ankara. downtown or Istanbul downtown, but we experienced it not far far outside of uh, Istanbul uh, in our summer house there. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, immediately a call we got from uh, one of our family members in Ankara saying something strange is happening here in Ankara. Fly you know, uh, uh, jets are flying low low flyovers in the city and uh, please uh, turn on the television. So very early we turned on the television and started following uh, the development of this coup attempt from uh, minute to minute from early in the evening. Right. So you were familiar with the Turkish politics. So you're definitely uh, aware of the previous coups in Turkey. So 1980, 1996 and the previous ones. So. I understand that you know about the Turkish uh, culture and the politics, but how did you decide to make a documentary about a military yeah. coup attempt in Turkey? Why did it? Why was it interesting for you? Why was it newsworthy for you to make yeah. a documentary about it? You know, I've been working as a journalist for many years. Uh, I've been, uh, but uh, the last part, uh, I've been at university as a professor working there and as a researcher. <laughs> I've been writing about Turkish politics and culture in Norwegian papers, mm -hmm. uh, interviewing authors uh, and, uh, and uh, activists from Turkey. Mm -hmm. So I knew a lot about the Turkish politics and the Turkish situation. And the thing is that as many of people in Turkey and outside of Turkey, they have heard the rumors about a, a coup attempt coming, you know, because mm -hmm. that has been in the papers the last six months before July uh, 2016. Okay. You know, so uh, so uh, in a way, everybody <laughs> perhaps expected something to happen. Right. And then suddenly something happened. Mm -hmm. So uh, we followed it closely and uh, switched between the channels and tried to understand what is really happening because uh, we didn't see any coup plotters. You know, usually when you have a coup, then you take over the media, you take over the leaders of right. the country, and then you go out with a message. Mm -hmm. So can um, you repeat that part, uh, Jorgen? You said that you didn't you didn't see the coup plotters. Yeah. What does it mean? Uh, we didn't see when we switched between the televisions, uh, oh. the different channels. We didn't see on the channels anybody sort of taking the responsibility for what was happening. I see. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing is that it was uh, all very chaotic. Uh, and I think uh, Turkish people and Turkish people I've been spoken to afterwards, they also experienced this as very chaotic and didn't really understand what is happening here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, then uh, late in the evening, uh, yeah, from 12.30 on, the only one person we saw on television was Erdogan, you know, mm -hmm. the FaceTime, he was the one speaking yeah. and, uh, and uh, talking about that he knew who the coup plotters 
uh, wear. Uh, so from that on, you know, things started to calm down in a sense. We started to understand that uh, nothing more will really happen, even though we followed the development a couple of more hours. Mm -hmm. And then one of the guys in, because we have a lot of people gathered there, families and friends, mm -hmm. and one of the older members of the family said that I have experienced several coup, coups mm -hmm. in Turkey. This is not a coup, he said. Right. So, you know, and then, you know, of course, then my brain started <laughs> working and seeing that there is something really strange happening here. Okay. Uh, Mr. Lorenzen, can you tell us what was that strange thing in that military coup attempt? Why was it different than the other established uh, military coup attempts in, uh, in, in, in Turkey or in different parts of the world that we have seen, that we have read before. What was the strange thing with that coup attempt? First of all, you can say, if you look at, for example, two very well-known coup, like the coup in 1980 in Turkey, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or the coup in Chile in 1973, which has been broadcasted, and we can see a lot of films about and documentaries about these two coups, you see that it's enormous amount of military out in the streets. Mm -hmm. It's immediately a lockdown. Uh, it's immediately a takeover of, uh, of the main, uh, you know, the president, the prime minister, the leaders of the country. And it's a total control immediately. Mm -hmm. Here, it was very few soldiers in the streets. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like when we saw from the bridge, when we saw from the airport, it looked like they didn't really know what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And we could see it sometimes, we could see a close up in their faces that they were disturbed, they were nervous, uh, they didn't really know what, what is happening here, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and then different type of messages was coming. So everything was very confusing and uh, it didn't look like a really, a really coup that mm -hmm. like we know so, from authoritarian regimes, you know? Right. So, uh, Jorgen, if it is not a real coup, what was it? I mean, are you suggesting that it might be a false flag coup attempt? You know, first of all, um, because something was strange, Mm -hmm. uh, on this level, then you start as a journalist asking questions. Right. And right. that is the most important part for me to do, that's asking questions. What kind of questions did you ask? Uh, first, I started to find people uh, and ask them uh, what they thought about this. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, which is very also strange, that no one really wanted to talk. Um, very few had any ideas. Mm -hmm. Uh, we saw thousands and thousands of people were fired from mm -hmm. schools, universities, uh, nurseries, uh, hospitals, that for sure we knew it had nothing very cool to do. Right. Of course, if you are a nurse working in a hospital mid-Turkey, you don't know anything about a coup attempt in the military. Right. So then, of course, you understand that there is something, uh, something going on here, which is uh, not... Uh, uh, re it's related to the coup attempt, of course, because it's a it's a cleansing of uh, of the Gulenists in the in the mm -hmm. um, in the system. But mm -hmm. not only the Gulenists. After a while, they also took Marxist, uh, right. Kurdish people, uh, other critical persons. That was uh, like they closed down uh, Chumuriyet very early. Mm -hmm. Uh, started the case against Chumuriyet, and now they have started new cases. So since 2016, you know, they have taken and and, and imprisoned anybody that is critical to the regime. So uh, you started to ask uh, critical questions about the coup attempt. And then did you go to Turkey to interview people? How long did you stay there and how long did it take? Yeah, and then in the beginning, it was very hard to find anybody, mm -hmm. uh, anybody that wanted to speak. Right. Uh, anybody that uh, knew anything because the people I spoke to, they knew very little and they were uh, also very confused. Right. And then, of course, uh, Ardoan uh, gave out uh, this uh, booklet of uh, proofs, sort of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and as a journalist, you can easily read that. And I spoke to a lot of other international journalists and you can easily see that this is full of mm -hmm. uh, not very valuable truth about what happened. 
So, so of course you can understand that uh, you you I, I felt that uh, there's something strange going on here. But uh, then I worked for the with a um, documentary for three years. Right. It took three years. Yeah, because the first year I almost got no information, right. no material, no documents, mm -hmm. and then people started leaving Turkey. Some high officers. Uh, starting uh, leaving Turkey, com in coming Europe. to Norway, coming to other countries in Europe. And then I was able to speak with top officers mm -hmm. in the military that had experienced it. What did they tell you? And then they started telling me, I mean, they are some of them are in the in the film. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a part of the of the of the army, a part of the uh, Navy. Mm -hmm. top officers in the navy and, and nato officers and they started telling me what they're telling me in the in the film that, that there is something strange here and they cannot understand it and they don't believe that it was mm -hmm. uh, a coup attempt in the way that Erdogan was telling about it something else is behind here but the thing is that and i have to say this honestly as a journalist and as a researcher and filmmaker that still i really don't know I cannot say for 100% sure that these people are behind or these people are behind or this happened because that that type of lost document is still missing. I see. So you still didn't make your final conclusion. That's right. Okay. So and you can see that also in the in the in the documentary that I'm not making a final conclusion. I'm just putting forward the material and saying there is another truth here than Erdogan is telling. Okay. So, uh, what is your impression in Europe, in European countries, in Western countries? Do you think that they bought that argument that it was Gulen moment behind that coup attempt? Do you think that the Europeans or, you know, the Western countries uh, bought that argument or uh, suggestion or claim? I've spoken with different uh, intelligence services in Norway, Germany, uh, EU, and uh, all of them say that uh, they don't believe that uh, Fethullah Gulen was behind the coup. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that I think that perhaps it can be a local or, or a lower level uh, officers plotting it together, that, and that can be Gulenists in that Mm -hmm. in that plot together with the Kemalists and others. You know, so they cannot um, sort of uh, rule out all kinds of uh, Gulen related people right. because we don't yet know who is really behind mm -hmm. the coup attempt. So what do you think about the responsibility of the uh, Turkish intelligence, director of the Turkish intelligence and the uh, the commander in chief of the time, Hulusi Suakar, because uh, Right after the coup attempt, they became the confidant of yeah. President Erdogan. So they started to uh, establish the country altogether. So mm -hmm. they took over the entire country altogether. So yeah. what did you learn about their potential or alleged responsibility in that plot? Of course, what I'm saying in the documentary, and I'm quite sure on that also, is that both Erdogan Hulusi Akkar and Hakan Fidan, they knew about any kind of coup attempt or coup plot ideas yeah. long before uh, 15 of July mm -hmm. uh, 2016. Uh, at least one week before. Uh, and uh, we can also see, because I followed the movements of Hulusi Akkar and Hakan Fidan, minute by minute, mm -hmm. 14th and 15th of July. And you can see very clearly that their movements uh, they are aware of what's what's happening and that something is happening. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you can ask, so uh, what are their part in it? Mm -hmm. uh, how do they move? Why do they move like they do? Uh, what do they think? What do they plan? Why don't they act? Uh, one, why don't they say that it's forbidden to fly over any place in Turkey uh, if they are afraid of a coup, uh, a coup attempt is coming, a coup plotting is coming? So they could do a lot of things before 15 of July, but they didn't do it. Yeah, did you? So, and, and what is very, very spooky, you can say, is that when uh, when um, Erdogan ordered uh, investigation uh, in uh, a month after the coup attempt, 
he closed the invest investigation of the three months, you know, okay. yeah. and in that investigation, neither Rulus Yakar or Hakan Fidan is being interviewed or asked to witness about right. their But doings and their knowledge. They refuse to answer the questions of the, yes. uh, you know, uh, the investigators, and they didn't go to, uh, they didn't go to the courts because yes. lawyers were asking them to come to the courts to, uh, to give their testimonies. And but did you see that scene that uh, uh, General uh, uh, Hulus Akar was not taken to the Akinjalar Air Base uh, forcibly? So you see that he's going there with you know with, with the other uh, officers very confident. So they say that Hulus Akar was actually the leader of the coup, yeah. but then they just he just pretended that you know he 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 was forced to go to. Yeah. You know, to the Akinjalar air base as a hostage. So there is definitely something going on and yeah. one day it will be uh, revealed, I guess. So uh, did you see that part that when he was taken, when he was going to the Akinjalar air base? What do you think about that? Yeah, I saw it and it's, uh, it doesn't fit uh, with, uh, with uh, what he's saying afterwards that he was forced to go there. Uh, right. And also witnesses saying that he was never forced to do anything. Right. Uh, he was uh, by free will there to come and to go and to move around as he wanted to. So no one pressured him to do anything. And uh, of course, when he say that afterwards that uh, he was uh, taken and forced to do it, it doesn't fit with the videos we, we can see from 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 the scenery. Right. So uh, it would be interesting. I would like I would let us say I would very much love to interview Hulusi Akar. Uh, about uh, his doings uh, those days. So, uh, are you uh, following the, the the most recent developments in Turkey? You know the corruption. So there is a uh, that Sedat Peker, the leader yeah. of an organized crime uh, group. So he made a lot of revelations about Erdogan and his close circles. He's right now been uh, located in United Arab Emirates. And there is another uh, businessman, Baran, Sezgin Baran Korkmaz. He was arrested in Austria uh, yeah. last week. And uh, right now he's requested by the United States government. Yeah. So, uh, what do you think uh, about these allegations and how are these allegations perceived in, in Europe? Yeah, you know, I followed the Turkish politics uh, for a long time. I monitored uh, a lot of uh, court cases right. uh, in uh, Chalayan and, and, and uh, you know, uh, and um, I know how it works that it's uh, it's not really truthful what's happening in uh, in court in the judiciary in uh, in Turkey, and it has been weakened year by year since 2016. Um, And um, when you think about Serhat Peker, it's very interesting because, of course, he was very close to him. We all know that he was very close to Erdogan before. And we're listening uh, closely to what he's saying. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and a lot of the things that he's saying, it fits very well into the knowledge we already have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, Cumhuriyet and Can Dündar, they already wrote about uh, the meat trucks bringing weapons. To, to, Syri to Syria and al-Nusra. Uh, and now he is confirming this, that this really happened. And he's also confirming other cases with, um, uh, with the killing of uh, one of the girls uh, and the conspiracy. Yeah, a lot of the things that he's saying fits very well into what we have already been thinking happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm looking forward to what he will reveal in the future also. Right. And after the coup, after the coup, I also went to U.S. and followed the Reza case in uh, in the U.S. court. Yeah, and it was uh, also very interesting, even though he wouldn't say very much about mm -hmm. uh, Erdogan and his relationship to Erdogan, but he confirmed uh, the uh, corruption. He confirmed right. the deals with uh, with Iran, uh, mm -hmm. the oil trade. And uh, and how it all happened, and he confirmed very much that uh, Erdogan and his family is uh, taking out a lot of money right. from the Turkish state and the Turkish people. Mm -hmm. uh, so we know so much about what Erdogan is doing, and uh, and and all the European countries they know everything about 
They know. I'm sure, for example, CIA, they yeah. have they have a they have a lot of material on what's happening in in Turkey okay. and what they're doing too. But so far, mm-hmm. they are keeping quiet. You mean the CIA or uh, the European Union? The European Union, CIA is keeping quiet. I tried to, wow. to ask CIA to reveal some material. I haven't got uh, anything out of it yet. Why are they keeping quiet? I think this is an agreement now among the European countries, among the NATO members. Right. Uh, to keep quiet, to keep Turkey as a member of the NATO alliance. I see. So they are tolerating Erdogan and his all crimes for yes. their own interests. Yes, and I think so. I'm, people, I'm sad to say it, but I think so. So in that case, the Turkish people are paying the bill because European Union and United States are tolerating Erdogan yeah. and crimes. Okay, yeah. so it's because you know you have to know also the strate- strategic position of Turkey uh, for a U- European and Western point of view. Uh, they they cannot. That, that they were thinking is that I cannot lose Turkey to an Eastern alliance to Russia, uh, and so that's a weakening, very very strong weakening of the of the Western situation. Right, and it's a very strong military uh, build up also in, in Turkey. So, did you notice that Sadat Peker stopped making videos? Uh, he stopped uh, his videos a day before the NATO summits. Yes, I know. So he's in United Arab Emirates, mm. and I think that United States is the only country which can tell United Arab Emirates to keep him quiet, to keep yeah. that Pekar quiet. Would you agree with that argument? Yeah, I think uh, he is. Uh, he is a little bit on the run. Uh, he has to be careful. Of course, I think uh, Erdogan's uh, long arms. Right. stretching out to different corners of the world uh, want to get hold of him so uh, he has to uh, be very very careful about with his movements right. and uh, perhaps he is also trying to make a deal with us you know to uh, to escape the us because right. if from emirate he can go safely to to us if he wants that right so you believe that he may want to go to united states it can be a possibility you know because that has happened with with others yeah you hear anything about that possibility i haven't uh, checked it out uh, right. okay. but he has he has to search for a safe haven you know for himself okay so if i would and he has a lot of knowledge of okay. course us is interested in his knowledge <laughs> if i would make that uh headline uh western intelligence services know everything about Erdogan, but keep quiet Would that be okay? Uh, it's a strong headline, but I think it's the I think it is the case. It's the case, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Jorgen. Thank you so much for, for this uh, wonderful conversation. Thank you. Uh, I had I had a remarkable guest from Norway today, Mr. Jorgen Lorentzen. So he is a film director, scholar, and a writer. And thank you so much, sir, again. Thank you. It's a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you.